Now at this stage, we have our pair of services, the catalog service and the stats service defined here, being served by the cap room timer. We can see that here in the second window. So we've got the catalog service with its three entities, authors, books, and orders, and the stats service with the single entity order info. And we've of course got our business logic in our cap service.js file. These services refer to entities that are actually defined within the db schema.cds file. So you can notice that until now, we've been working primarily in the SRV directory, the serve or service directory, and the DB directory, the database directory. But when you generate a CAP application, you'll see that you also get by default an empty app folder. And the app folder is almost like for the third layer. So we have a, a persistence layer at the database level. We have a service layer where we have our entity definitions of business logic. And then we have our consumption layer for front end applications that can consume the services that we've created. And that's what we're going to, what we're going to do in this exercise. If you've been looking at this welcome to CDS services page, you'll see, for example, that Within the catalog service, we can go and have a look at the books entity set, for example, or the orders entity set, but also next to each of these entity names, these entity links, we have a dot, dot, dot in Fiori link. Now, if we select one of these, we'll see that what we get automatically provided to us by the CAP framework, a Fiori list report ready for us to build upon. Okay, it's fairly empty so far. For example, we don't have any titles for these fields here. But it's a great start. If we go back and have a look at the documentation in the about section that talks about CAP being both open and opinionated, we see that it has, as you might expect, out of the box support for Fury as a design language and implementation of UI5 in this case, with which we can build very, very powerful and capable apps. And it also has, of course, out of the box support for SAP HANA as a persistence layer. That doesn't mean to say that that's what we're restricted to. We can choose any UI technology we want. It gives an example here in this paragraph of Vue.js. And there are many other libraries and facilities for building UIs that you can use with services from CAP. However, in this particular exercise, we're going to build a very, very simple Fury app. So rather than use this out of the box thing here, we're going to build it ourselves so we can understand the component parts that go to make up that UI. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to this app directory and create a very simple HTML file. We're going to call it index.html, uh, but we're going to place it in a, a subdirectory called web app by convention. And in there, we're just going to save some basic HTML. Now we're going to restart the CDS watch, but once we've restarted this, we shouldn't have to restart it for subsequent modifications to static content in this app directory. Okay, so let's open that in a new tab. We've got that over there. Let's bring it over there. Notice now that as well as the two services, we've also got this web app index.html. Let's have a look to see what that's giving us so far. Not much. We have a completely empty web page. But what we do have is a title, Bookshop, which is coming directly from the title in the header of this HTML file. So we know that this HTML file is being served for us already. OK, so what does that mean? It means that we have a canvas upon which to paint our Fury app in the form, of course, of a UI5 powered application. So the next thing we want to do really is to start adding various UI5 constructions so that we can build towards our app. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to add a series of three script elements. I'll put them in here first of all, and then we can talk about them and have a look what they are. So in between the title within the head and the end of the head, I've added three script elements. 
The largest script element here is, if you're familiar with UI5, is the UI5 bootstrap. It loads UI5. Just above that, we have something that you would not normally see in a productive application. And that is a link to the Ushell bootstrap sandbox.js. Now, what's that? That is a sandbox version of the Fury Launchpad. Ushell stands for Universal Shell and the Fury Launchpad. You, could, you, can, you can see the Fury Launchpad as an implementation of the concept of a universal shell. So what we're doing here with this script tag is we're bringing in a Fury Launchpad sandbox that we can run for ourselves. Now, the definition of tiles to appear in that sandbox Fury Launchpad, that definition is contained in a global variable called SAP Ushell config. And this third script tag that we've pasted in here prepares us for being able to specify what those tiles or what those applications, that's the keyword here, are. So within the context of these three script tags, already we're building towards a Fury. Why don't we just save this now and refresh this page to see if we get anything different. As you can see, we get effectively a Fury launchpad here with the normal artifacts you'd expect to find on a launchpad. For example, the logo, some navigation, a user icon, and a search icon. Great, so far so good. So now within the context of this applications property within the SAP Ushell config global property, we can add a definition for an app. And that definition we can put inside of the applications map here. And that's what it looks like. In fact, let's just indent that one more so we can see a little bit better. So when you're defining tiles and relationships to apps that should be instantiated when those tiles are clicked, you have a stanza, a JavaScript object that looks like this. We have the intent, browse books, we have the title and description that should appear on the tile. We have information about the type of app it is. It's a UI5 component style app where the component name is Bookshop. And that's where it's to be found, web app, which is the reason why we created this directory here. So that's saved as well. It's saved automatically. Why don't we refresh this page to see what happens? And we can see the result of defining this browse books section within the applications object, we get a tile. When we click on it, we get an error, of course, because app couldn't be opened because the SAP UI5 component of the application could not be loaded. Of course, it couldn't be loaded because we haven't defined that component yet. So let's do that next. Within the web app directory, where we've got our index.html, all we need to do is create a file called component.js. Now this component.js file name is a convention within UI5 and it's where we define our UI5 component. This is a JSON manifest based component. So that means that all the detail of what this component is and should do and relies upon is defined in a separate manifest file that's described in JSON, which we'll add shortly. The component itself is based upon a standard library app component within the SAP FE namespace, FE standing for front end. So why don't we now refresh the page again? And if we click on the tile, we get please wait. Now let's have a look to see what's happening in the background. We can see that we've got all sorts of different problems here. The most significant of which is error. Resource undefined could not be loaded from web app manifest.json. Check file not found. So effectively, it's trying to load a file called manifest.json from the web app directory. Now, of course, we've deliberately not created that yet. So let's create that now. So again, in the same place inside of web app, let's create manifest.json. And that is the file 
that the UI5 runtime will look for to describe the component here. And that is directed by this directive here. Into there, we'll place quite a large but fairly understandable manifest. We have some general information in that manifest. We have information about the data source that the UI is going to consume. And that data source has a URI path of slash catalog, which is of course where our catalog service is available. It is of course an OData service at version 4.0. We have a number of uh, UI5 specific configurations. Not only do we have the default model specified here, which takes its data source from what we've just looked at up here, the catalog service. So this thing here, oops, this thing here refers to this data source here. But of course, we also have an inter internationalization model as well, which again, for those familiar with UI5 development, is a completely normal thing. The next section in the manifest describes what to show when. So when there's no subsequent pattern after the path on the URL, we want to show the books list target. The books list target is a component based upon the list report component within that sap.fe library. And we can say in the options for that template, we can say that the main entity set to which the details should be bound is the books entity set from our catalog service. We also have a navigation set of details here, which means that when an item in the books entity set is selected, the user is routed to the books details target, which is down here, which is also specified up here in the main routes. And the books details target describes another page based upon another template within sap.fe, which is the object page template to show a single object, a single book in this case. And again, we're binding the books entity set to the page based upon this template. So now let's go and refresh this page. We don't get much information right now because we haven't really defined what should appear in the list report. So this is where we return to our roots. This is where we return to CDS and the ability to not only define entities and navigations between those entities, but also to define annotations. So now what we want to do is go back to the SRV directory and create a new file in there called index.cds. Now the presence of an index.cds file will override any individual CDS file so that we can control in a single place the entities that get exposed. So in here, we're going to create a single using line, first of all, saying using from catalog service. Okay, so that will bring in the definitions within the catalog service.cds file, but not the definitions in the stats service file. But what we also want to do now is to start adding using CDS start adding some annotations to that OData service, start annotating the elements, the entities, the properties in our OData service. And with annotations, we can drive these Fury element based UIs. So here's some examples of some annotations. We can see fairly straightforwardly that we're first of all annotating the books entity set inside the catalog service service. And all the annotations that we're going to be making in this section here are within the UI section. For example, say, well, we, would, we want in the header area here, a selection field to allow us to select by title. We get out of the box a search field, but we want another field here where we can specify a title. When it comes to visible columns in the table, we can use the line item, the UI.line item annotation to specify a list of properties within the books entity that should appear. Now I say within the books entity, but note you can 
extend beyond that if there's a navigation property, because here we're listing the name property of the author entity that is linked from the books entity with an association. And there are also other annotations here. For example, when we are looking at a particular entity on an object page, the title and description are relevant, and we'll see that shortly. And finally, within the header info, we have the type name and the type name plural, i.e. what the thing is and what the things are from a plural perspective. So we've got that saved. Let's restart and go back, close that. Let's open in a new tab again. Let's bring that tab to there and have a look in a bit more detail. We'll choose the tile. And now what do we see? We see the results of these annotations. We've got the search field as standard, but we now also have a title selection field here. And that's a direct result of this selection field's title. In the rows, to be, we have an ID field, a title, an author name, an author ID, and a stock field. Those correspond directly to these properties listed here. We can also see that the, the type name plural is used here. So why don't we actually run the request? And we can see we get the data pulled in as you'd expect. Now there's one more thing that we want to do just to make things a little bit neater. And that is to make this look a little bit better. At the moment, we've got non-translated property name style titles here. What we really want is something we'll say, for example, author space name, author space ID. So we want to bring in some quote unquote translation, some internationalization. So let's do that as the last thing in this exercise. Within the serve directory, not within the app directory, but within the serve directory, we want to create a file called i18n internationalization.properties, which is the default internationalization properties file. But we want to create that within a well-known directory location, also called i18n. In there, we can line up translated texts to their property name equivalents. So where we have the author name property, we want author space name, for example. Now, by convention, in this default internationalization properties file, we have English, but you can have many internationalization files in different locales according to your requirements. The reason that we're defining internationalization properties within the SRV directory is because these properties are related to the OData service, not to elements in the app itself. If you wanted to have translations for elements within your UI5 based Fiori app as well, then of course you would put an i18n folder within this web app directory as well. So let's refresh. And there we go. We now have translated internationalized titles for our data rows. Finally, just to see what the effect of the rest of the annotations are here. If we select one, for example, cat weasel, we see that in the object page, we have the title and the description defined here. So there we have it, a very round roundabout way of getting to a Fiori list report and object page, but we've learned a little bit more than what we might have learned just by clicking on the dot, dot, dot in Fiori. Thanks for watching.